Uh, he's here today to talk to us about when to intervene. So without further ado, let me introduce Ken Seeley. Thank you. We have to use this, huh? Nice to meet you. We have to use this, huh? So um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I want to thank you know Josie for asking me to uh, come here today and be a part of this and you know um, uh, Sovereign Health for putting on this great luncheon. I mean, a lot of you turned out. I'm so grateful to be here. I'm so grateful and honored to uh, work with all of you. And as we heard of everybody going around the room, there's a lot of years of experience in this room, a lot of years. And um, being that I'm using this, can we plug in the fan? It's a little hot, right? <laughs> Thank you. I, I, if you can't hear me, I'll turn it up a little, or move it up a little further. But, um, but before we get started right now, I, I would just like to take the opportunity for all of us because uh, um, for the gratitude that we all have. I know Josie posted it on her. Thank you so much. I know Josie posted it, or posted it on her uh, emails about the uh, loss of this week for um, of Betty Ford. And so before we get started, for the grati gratitude that we all have because, you know, because of her, we're all here today. You know, we're all here helping millions of people, but she's the one that carved the road for us. So I would just like to take a moment to, you know, silence to honor her and her, everything she's done for us. Thank you. So how to intervene. Um, Really, I mean, working in the years of in this field, like all of you have, you know, there's many ways to intervene. There's many different times to intervene. It's really about um, when I get called in for intervention and the other interventionists, that when we get called in and the other interventionists um, that are in the room, when we get called in, we get called in normally when the disease is like on stage four in the later stages of the disease. I mean, it is... Uh, you know, major family crisis. They're like, oh my God, if you don't get here, somebody, you know, we're, they're, they're all in shambles. So there's a lot of dysfunction. There's a lot of problems within the family systems that we come in and intervene. But in the years of working in the field, we realize that that's not enough. You know, that's not enough. What, what I, I want to see after this presentation is that we all take something from this that it's really about intervening in the earlier stages. You know, that's where I see this business going to in the future. You know, I see we have a, we have, we're at one point today, but we need to get to the next level. And it's about giving the public, you know, I, I also have been honored to be a part of that uh, A&E intervention show for many years. And, you know, the show does a great job at educating the public that they don't have to sit back and wait for the devastation of the disease in order to or lose their loved one or wait till they go to jail. You know, you don't have to wait that long. You could intervene and get them help. So I'm grateful that they've been able to accomplish that goal. But I think the next goal that we should as treatment providers is we should give the, the public the information that they need to intervene before it gets to that level. That, I believe, is our responsibility. That's our responsibility. We have a lot of years of, of um, people working in the field in this room, and we have a lot of, uh, of people that you know, know what they're doing, but we need to give it to the public. It's, we need to give them the tools so they could see the early signs so it doesn't go down that horrible road where we get called in as interventionists. And that's kind of my goal of, of all of this is really helping, you know, all of you, no matter where you're at in the treatment process. I mean, I know there's a lot of treatment providers here today. There's a lot of um, interventionists here today. And, and really, it's about all of us working together. So that's why I'm grateful that we're all here in the same room because we can't do this alone. No one person, no one treatment facility. We can't get the message across to the public that needs our help alone. We need to be unified. We need to be a united front of what needs to happen to get that message out. So what I really want to do is um, when to intervene. I want to talk to, you know, all of you about, 
you know, and ask questions. I want this to be more of interactive. I don't want this to be boring where we're sitting here for an hour and everybody's like, oh, God, this is exhausting. I want it to be <laughs> interactive. I want to hear from you on what your needs are when you get a person, because most of the people here work in treatment, you know, from what going around the room of what I heard. So I really want to hear from you what your needs are of getting that person into treatment. Um, so what are, some of the, what are the, some of the things that you believe that anybody, you know, could raise their hand and share? What, what are the things that you see when your patient is in, in treatment and you believe they may need an intervention? Does anybody have, like, an example of somebody that may have been a, a patient that um, isn't fully compliant, that isn't fully participating in the treatment protocol? And what do you, what do, you do in your practice to get them compliant? Anybody? I was going to say I'm in the wrong room. <laughs> oh, my God. Go ahead. Great. Did everybody hear that back there? So what I'm hearing is that if, if they are getting well too fast, what you do is you see the red flags as a treatment provider and seeing that they're not really compliant with the program and they're, getting, they're kind of going into recovery too quickly, really not grasping, telling the treatment professionals what they want to hear. So you're seeing about re-intervening at that time when they're in that safe environment and getting... I like to call them the healthy boundaries, but the addict always sees them as the consequences. So you bring back in the family on um, putting together healthy boundaries in order to re-intervene to get them motivated and active and wanting to be, or to participating. Is that it? That's great. Anybody else? Especially with what? With yeah. Uh, yep. Okay. So what she what she just said, if anybody had, if everybody didn't hear that, from what I heard is is that you work as in an outpatient facility, and if they are being non-compliant to your treatment protocol, you look for a higher level of care and bring in a treatment provider for inpatient for that person to go to, and you bring in the family system and educate them on how to support them in their recovery. Is that it? Great. And, and that's one of the things that we really do is, is, and again, you know, being a part of um, 
doing interventions, you know, my pre-interventions when I work with families with what you're talking about, you know, that's really the meat and potatoes of the interventions and nobody really sees that, what we do, but really working with the family system, I mean, the, the shortest time that I have working with them is a minimum of four hours, a minimum, and sometimes they go eight to 12. You know, just depending on how fast the family's grabbing onto the concept, how fast they're really getting in touch with what needs to happen to get that, that their loved one, the addict, to surrender to get to treatment. So what I've learned is that, you know, um, and as a lot of clinicians, a lot of people in this room that um, are, are at that point of the person coming in and asking for help. They're looking for some type of treatment, either inpatient, outpatient, the families are looking for interventionists, but there's, there comes a point where they hit a form of a rock bottom, as we all call it. But what is the best patient that all of you have coming into treatment, coming into your private practice, that is the, the person that is the most willing? What is the best patient? Anybody have one of those examples? So did everybody hear that one? She's in the middle, yeah. So great, I love that one. That's really good, getting them through that first month, doing whatever you say, you know, and that level of willingness is what I'm hearing when they first come in. So what, what, I, what she's saying here is that the best person that, the person that comes in the most willing or gets the best care is when they have the family involvement. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah and, and I agree. I think that if we could get the family unified, the family properly educated on the concept of the disease, get them on when they're supporting the addiction and when they're supporting the disease and show them where that line is but building that line with the family so they could be clear on when to or when not to. And that's why a lot of people that work in this room deal with case managers for that first year of their recovery because we want to be able to help the family because just because they go to a couple of Al-Anon meetings, they're not going to get it like that. We know it's going to take time. So within that first year, they're having somebody that is educated in the field that could guide them to say, oh, no, this isn't right, or yes, this would be okay. So you're right. The family involvement is key, in my opinion. So what he's saying is the biggest challenge is having the family as a support factor when we, when we do an intervention, is getting the whole family system on that page. Because what I've been doing for many years is the family believes the addict over here is the problem. 
if they would only change their behaviors, we would all have a better life. And they don't realize, and getting them to understand, that they have to change their behaviors. Uh, a good friend of mine, I'll give him credit right off the top, John Southworth, I'm sure a lot of you know him, he always says you take a leopard out of a leper colony and you put them back into the leper colony after they've been treated, what's going to happen? They're going to get leprosy again. You know, it's not, they're not going to be able to sustain their recovery because they've, they've given, you've given them all the tools possible to fight this disease and give them the strength. But in all reality, they don't have a chance if they go back to that healthy, unhealthy family system. They don't have a chance. So I agree. I think it's really important in getting the whole system. Did you? And that has, did anybody hear that one? That it, he really doesn't see it as the family does participate. And you're 100% right. Out of all the hundreds of families that I've worked with, I would say 2% really take what we suggest and go to Al-Anon and work a program and get a sponsor and work the steps. So you're absolutely right. But what I do also realize is that even though they're not going to do everything we recommend, we look for what they will do and they will follow the recommendations of the case manager and call the case manager before they make any decisions, before they decide to say yes or no. And I love what he just said, and that'll bring us to the next part, is, is what you just said about the, the males, the pilots that you work with, the consequence of losing their career, losing everything they worked hard enough for, hard for in all those years, that seems to get them into recovery. And there's a shifting point that everybody in recovery, you know, tomorrow I'm going to be celebrating 22 years in this program. And it's because of this pro, because, thank you. But it, it's because of, there's, there was a consequence on my shoulder when I first got into recovery. When I checked into treatment, there was a consequence. I got fired from my job. I lost my way of earning money and able to support myself. So that was the consequence that was enough to get me in the door. And then there comes a point where the addict is in recovery because they enjoy their lives of what they've learned, of what you've all taught them. Use these modalities instead of drinking and using that you teach them in treatment. And they start working that and they say, wow, this is amazing. I'm really you know, gaining so much. And they're starting to reap the benefits of the family life, of being productive in society, doing stuff that they love doing, you know, finding what makes them tick and working, you know, doing those type of things. And so then you get into recovery where you want to be in recovery because you reap the benefits. But where does that addict cross that line from being over here of the consequence, like the pilot losing the license, and he also mentioned the mother that loses the children. Again, another consequence that's back here, getting them motivated to come into treatment. So over here, that's what gets you in the door. And what, from my experience, it could take, and I take my experience from what I know from working with the doctor's diversion programs, the lawyer's assistants, the pilots, any high licensed professional, and the drug court programs. I'm taking that experience from there. When that consequence is back here on their shoulder, it takes a good year and a half. Drug courts are a year and a half. Doctor diversion programs, three to five years. Lawyer assistants, three years. So they're following them. What is it for pilots?
Yeah. That's why they have the success rate. People say, well, they have the success rate because they all have barely got too much to lose. I don't believe that. Yeah. Uh, you, you give people a lot to lose, and, and, and the ones that, you know, that just go to A on their own, the fact that they have to lose, that ain't to lose, doesn't stop them from realizing. Yes. So what he said is with the pilots program, the reason why they have an 85 to 95 percent success rate, huge success rate in recovery, huge, because of that reason is because they're being watched. And that's where I think we as a treatment team providers for this disease, we need to follow that, that program. Follow that program. And just because the people that I work with aren't high licensed professionals and they aren't convicted felons going through the drug court program just because they're not at that spit stage in their, their lives or maybe never will be a high licensed professional and hopefully they will never have to go to the drug court program but it's not fair there's a huge line of people that are in between that gap and that's where it's important for case management and monitoring for everyone and we'll, we're going to talk more about that in the future so the person that, you know, you guys gave some really good examples of the person that is the most ambitious, the amb ambitious, the person that is the most willing when they show up on your doorstep. When I get called in for an intervention, there's zero willingness. Uh, the family's already tried hundreds of times, right? They've, they've tried to get their loved one in. They've said this, you know, I had this one woman on this, at this fema female that, you know, it's about, you know, it, it, numerous times before they get to the point of calling in a professional numerous times so they've already tried that um, but the one that is the most effective is the one that feels the most discomfort from what I, from what I've been told in the years the most discomfort and has suffered enough consequences that they they feel like I can't live this way, way anymore and they show up in your office willing because they, there's too much pain within. There's too many consequences that if they pick up a drink and do the same behavior, that they don't want to live that way anymore. And that's when what you were talking about earlier about the person coming into your treatment center, that's what we're talking about. That person has hit that rock bottom that we all need to hit in order to change our behaviors. So with that being said, we go into, you know, um, how do we create it? You know, what we've been doing is, you know, for years on end, we've been hearing about family members that um, say, well, what is a rock bottom? You know, how, does, how do I get my, per my loved one to hit a rock bottom? And, um, and I would go around the room and I would ask my colleagues, what is a rock bottom? Well, it's different for everybody, so there really isn't any way to define it. And, you know, in a way I express it to my families, it's like a thumbprint. You know, every single one of us is different. There is no identical thing that I could tell one family to do and then tell the next family I'm working with to do that's going to get them to create that rock bottom and feel enough discomfort to be willing enough to come into your doors and, and participate in your treatment process. There's no, there's no cookie cutter in this. And that's why I think it's really important for the interventionist to be highly skilled. As we were talking about earlier, you know, being an interventionist, I have so many people that we train and so many people that we work with. And, you know, being an interventionist is really about being able, you know, again, John Southworth always says, it's like being in a tennis match. And you got to be able to respond immediately as Gene knows, right? you got to be quick and on your feet. You can't say, oh, uh, let me think about that. And then you go over here and you call your team. Oh, what do, we, what do you do about that? Like when you're treatment team in a treatment center. You don't have the time to do that because the wrong decision and you learn, lose control of that individual or that family system you're put on the, you're, you're disregarded. They don't listen to you anymore. The minute they lose you, you lose them, you're out of the picture. So you got to be really quick. You have to be skilled at what you're doing. And, you know, it's really about this is life or death when you're on the field, when it's in stage three. You have to be able to, to really no, navigate around that process. So what we come up with in the, in the last years is how to define a rock bottom. What is it? 
you know, how do we define it? So this is what we've come up with about five years ago, is the first one is something happens in regarding their health. Um, the doctor tells them, if you don't stop drinking, your liver's going jaundice, you know, you got to stop or else you're going to die. Some people, that's enough of a rock bottom. They code in an emergency room. That's, you know, for some addicts, that's enough. When I get called on an intervention, they've already coded in the emergency room. They've already, you know, been told by their physician that they're not going to live if they don't get help. You know, that doesn't seem to matter. But for the lower bottoms, this is a reason. You know, going to 12-step meetings for all these years, I hear people sharing what it was like, what happened, and what it's like today. What happened, sometimes that's enough for some people. So if that's enough, just unfortunately it's not when I get involved. But it is a rock bottom that helps some people. And I, had, I asked the families to put this part in their letter when they're preparing their letter during the intervention to just remind them about their health. And we were talking about eating disorder interventions too. That's huge. That's a health component that you bring in there that you could add different things that you've noticed or their doctors have told them and put that in the letter to get them to kind of create that rock bottom that they need to hit to be at a level of surrender when they come into your doors. So the health one. The next one is the environment. And um, the environment is the one of the people in their lives. The, you know, as we were just down doing a family group in Florida this, this past week, and the doctor that we were working with is like, when they get to us, there's two environments. It's the family and the drug dealer. That's it. <laughs> you know, that's what their environment is, <laughs> the family and drug dealer. So, so their environment has a huge role in either supporting their addiction, as the drug dealer would, or supporting their recovery as we're going to train the families on how to support recovery. So really the environment, and as an employer, that's part of their environment. We bring that in. As I said earlier, my, my rock bottom was my employer that came into me. So the environment is, is pretty much the one that we, we work with during a professional intervention. We gather the, the pieces of the environment, and we determine on how to raise that rock bottom to turn it into a reality. The, the emotional part of it is, I would say, 75% of the patients or the people that I work with um, and the families that we work with, 75%, Gene would know too, like 75%, after you read the letters and after you go through the process, the emotional component of that, of the addict feeling, wow, these people really love me. These people really care. 75% with maybe just a little bit of a push, that's it. That, that's all that re interventionists that are out there, that's all that you really need is giving them the tools of writing the letter, giving the new communication skills. 75% of them go in through the emotional rock bottom that they feel the love in the room. They feel the connection with their loved ones. And that is the thing that makes them want to check into treatment. I mean, that's the thing that gets them. It's the mother with the daughters. We're, we're going in. When I, when I work with families, I say, I want you to speak from your heart because they will hear it in their heart. You know, you're not speaking out of judgment, anger, resentment because of all of the, the behaviors that have been demonstrated. You're coming in from a place, if they're in their in their deathbed, how would you communicate to, to them there? And that's where these letters, and that's where the environmental and the emotional is a rock bottom. The next one is um, that we work with is a legal rock bottom. And we talked about that, about um, the legal consequences. I, uh, I have a lot of families that we work with, and the legal consequences, what normally happens, and I'm sure you've all seen this before, is when they hit illegal consequences, what do the families normally do? Bail them out. <laughs> Lawyer up. Bail them out. <laughs> wow, you guys work with the same people I work with. <laughs> Lawyer up. Bail them out. Get them out of there. Um, and get them the help to get out of the legal consequence that would be part of the natural progression of the disease because again I hear a lot of people that finally surrender to recovery of spending time in jail maybe that's where they need to get it but I don't I don't believe that jail is the the, the right place for people to recover but I believe that you could give them the option to say you either be compliant in a program of recovery 
if you choose not to, you will suffer the legal consequences of the laws that you are breaking because of your addiction and your behaviors. So there's a little bit of a twist there. It's like, you know, they, the person understands that we're going to help them get out of this. We're going to help them get out of this and out of their legal consequences, but there's a condition on it moving forward. We are only going to help you if you are compliant with your treatment providers at the treatment facility and your case management. And, you know, we always used to call it years ago a discharge plan when they leave treatment. Now we're learning to call it in the industry a continuum level of care, so a continuum care plan. And what is the next level? You know, sometimes it's a level up, as you were talking about with your outpatient clinics. Sometimes it's a level up versus a level down. So depending on where they are in their surrender to their recovery, we will either determine is it a level up or is it a level down. And that's where I think really we as, as professionals working in the field is really about where do we see this person at? You know, and don't let them just go because they're in, at the end of their 30, 60, 90 day stint, but really looking at how are we going to use the environment. And legal is part of that environment because, again, addicts and alcoholics that are out there, and even people that, I mean, I, we do interventions on mental illness, and um, we, we, beha we conduct illegal behavior and able to keep our disease or our illness alive. So we'll do un you know, dysfunctional things and un illegal things. So we just have to be a reminder, a gentle reminder is all I'm saying. We're not here to come in and attack these people. These are sick individuals, as we all know. This is not a choice that they're making, but just like you were talking about with the pilots, we're the gentle reminder that if they fall out of compliancy, like you do, if, if they fall out of compliance, there is a consequence. There is a consequence. And hopefully but between the three years, they get that they enjoy the benefits of living in recovery. But if not, and they just choose to drink again, now they're in it for lifetime. lifetime. I love that. I think that. I think everything should be that. I mean, as we were talking earlier, I was talking with a doctor up there that about, you know, people, where did he go? Uh, we were talking about, you know, the continuum level of care and people really monitoring, you know, with other diseases out there, you know, heart disease, you know, um, diabetes, cancer, with all these other diseases out there, there's a protocol put into place that monitors them for a certain level of time before they're released. Every one of the diseases, there's a protocol put into place. I don't know one that there isn't. There's a protocol put into place, and what I'm, what I'm recommending that all of us as a united front go with the mentality moving forward today that we follow the, the tools that work with the high licensed professionals. And that's what we really, we've come with. So illegal rock bottom, again, is, a, is another one. Um, the next one is a personal finance, and it spells out helps, as we first saw on the first slide. Um, personal finances. Financially, we have to keep our, our living environment alive and we have to support it financially. So how do we support the drugs or the alcohol? How do we support ourselves? And normally what happens when we get involved is there's somebody on the outside that's supporting them. Somebody's giving them money for this or that or that or this or sometimes the employer, as we talk again with the pilots, you know, I love this one, you know, the pilots, they're going to be let go, it, you know, in that process and not be employed anymore if they're not going to be compliant. That's their financial, you know, that's their fi where their financial means come from. That's, that's what supports their lifestyle. And I'm telling you, this one is so important. And, and I never, again, this is, there's no cookie cutter here. I, this is a thumbprint because sometimes I love getting the employers involved. You know, sometimes I think that is one of the key components, but I don't want to get the employers involved if it's going to sabotage and they don't understand the disease of addiction. Getting somebody like yourself that understands it, I think it's a win-win. Now they're being monitored, they're being case managed, it's, it's just part of the protocol. But if you get somebody, an employer involved, like you know, a, a restaurant owner that supports addiction in their, in their environment, 
you know, they're not going to sit there and support recovery for this person. So there's no cookie cutter. There's no one way that fit, one th shoe that fits all. We really got to look at the environment as a whole. But how do we take away the personal finances? What are the things that we could do to educate the family to get them? And I, I want to be perfectly clear on this, that this is not a punishment. And this is not about this is what we're prepared to do. We always give them an option. We always give them an option. We say to them, if you choose not to get treatment and check into recovery or participate in recovery, if you choose not to participate in recovery, we will go to your employer. We have to. We will get child protective services involved because it's not safe for these kids to be brought up in a, in a, a family system that is raising, being raised by an addict. It's not fair. So we would have to get child protective. So we have to go through the, the levels of what, where we go regarding creating a rock bottom. And the last one is a spiritual rock bottom. And again, I think... Personally, I believe in the people that get many, many, many years of recovery, they have all talked about their spiritual rock bottom. But unfortunately, we have no control over their health, and we have no control over their spiritual rock bottom. There's no control whatsoever as the family system, as a treatment provider, as anybody out there has control over those two. But what we do have control over are the other ones. We have control over their environment, getting the family system involved. We have control over their personal finance, and we have control over their legal consequences that they would need to suffer if they chose not to be in recovery. So <clears throat> when we work with people in, in the treatment field, are any of you familiar with um, the laws in Florida regarding the Marchman Act and the Baker Act? You are? So um, I wish every state had those laws. Um, what they are is all it takes is a, a physician, a, a doctor to sign a release or sign a, a document to go to the court and a family member that they are, you know, in danger to themselves or others because of either with the Marchman Act, it's with drugs or alcohol, and with the Baker Act, it's mental illness. But all it takes is those two signatures. And what happens in there when, when they sign that document, it goes in front of a court, and the court will send them in for a week assessment. And during that week assessment, they usually, 99.9% .9 of the time, recommend 60 days of inpatient care to get them to really get a true diagnosis and find out where that person is, and the courts mandate it. And if they're non-compliant, the court throws them in jail. They'll say, you either follow this court order or you will go to jail. I believe every state should have this law. It's just an easy way to help people that, you know, because if the disease of addiction, the number one symptom of this disease is denial, then they're not going to see the light. They're not going to need to see some consequences. And if we could get a court order that's going to get them to mandate treatment for that time, it's one of my favorite laws in the world. I mean, I, I think it's just everybody should have it, every country, every state. But when they're, when they're in treatment, and unfortunately we're in California, <laughs> so we don't have that law, and they're in treatment, and all of you have seen that patient, that is non-compliant and non-willing to participate and kind of doing their time. You know, they're doing their time because they know that if they don't do their time, they, the licensing board is looking at them. If they don't do their time, then their children's, you know, will be taken away from them. If they don't do their time, their spouse is going to leave them. But you know in your hearts, as professionals, you know there's no movement here. But nothing's happening. Has anybody seen that? Yeah. <laughs> Never. Okay, I'm in the wrong room. <laughs> so, you know, and, and in Florida, again, about that law, if they're non-compliant while they're in treatment, all you have to do is go back and let the judge know that they're not, they're not participating, and it's just like not being there. So I saw somebody out in the hallways during a session while they were supposed to be in group, and I was dropping off another patient, and I said 
I think we better just call 911 right now and let them know that you're being non-compliant. And the doctor was there as out greeting me when I had the other client. And she looked up to the doctor and said, can you do that? And the doctor's like, oh, yeah. You know, it's, it's about that you're in compliancy while you're in treatment. And boom, talk about a shift in her behavior. <laughs> she went right in there and started complying. But because we're in California, it's, it, we don't have that in our back pocket as a tool that we could use. So what we recommend is getting an interventionist involved. Oh, thank you. Getting an interventionist involved, and you know, um, as you were saying about earlier about people that um, you reintervene when they're in treatment and they're non-compliant. Uh, a lot of the places that we work with is they would rather have an outsider kind of. They call me the hammer, <laughs> coming in with the hammer effect of you know, here are your consequences. It's kind of like you're the hammer. I'm sure. <laughs> where you're where you work you're the hammer where you know I'm gonna have to go back to the licensing board and report you if you are non-compliant right and so to have that person in the treatment team in the field of the in this facility it's good to have somebody that's just uh, just set aside for that role but then to come in as a therapist and work with them because you really want them to be you know open during therapy you want them to be participating in that process and they're not going to feel it if they have me sitting in the room they're going to be shut down because i'm the one that educated the families i'm the one that educated the system that they do have the power to either turn up the heat or turn down the heat of either if they're in the line of recovery or in the line of addiction so they don't usually want me sitting in that room you know the the, the patient so so what I do is they call me the hammer that I come in for the treatment centers, and we come in and we re-intervene like you were talking about. You know, we may gently, of course, they're in treatment, but we got to figure out from the family system, what is it that means something to them? What is it? You know, only, what, 10% maybe are high-licensed professional, maybe another 5% are mothers, and we have all seen mothers walk away from their children. There's nothing more heartbreaking, but we've seen that happen. So what is it that's going to create that rock bottom for that individual and help the families dis dis figure out what that is and then remind the patient that if you are non-compliant in the treatment process, this is what your life, it's kind of what you teach of play the tape through while they're in treatment. Play the tape through. If you use, what's going to happen? Keep the tape going. You know, it's not going to be just using. You're going to end up boom, 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 right back where you were before you came in here and more than likely a million times worse. So tape, play the tape through. So we're the ones to gently bring that to their attention and then turn them back over to the treatment providers to, and I'm talking about the private uh, uh uh, therapists that have their private practices, we turn them back over to them, but they get that gentle reminder. So when they show up in their therapy, they show up in treatment, again, we go back to the beginning where they're willing, because that's where you all need them. They need to be willing. If there's no willingness and they sit there and everything's fine, what are we going to get? No results if everything's fine. So what we do is while we're doing that is we measure um, then, you know, when to intervene, um, you know, full-blown addiction, non-compliant, not engaged in treatment, and the warning signs. And the warning signs, a good way to measure warning signs that when we work with families, what are some of the warning signs that you guys have experienced? Before they go into a relapse, before they go into, you know, um, leaving the early AMA. What are some of the warning signs that you've guys seen? The beds are bad. They'll make something up. <laughs> I love that one. The worst place in the world. The staff is going to rape them. Oh, that's, I haven't heard that one before. 
not safe. So these are some of the warning signs that you see that they're going to go, they're going to pretty much end up back into their full-blown addiction. They don't really have a chance because there's no level of surrender while they're in treatment. Do you have another one? Oh, huge. When she said when the parents are calling and telling the treatment providers, believing what they're saying, believing the addict. So we always say, you know, you don't believe a word that they say till they have a year clean. A word. When they're, li when they're talking, they're lying. Don't believe a word they're saying. <laughs> you know, come to the treatment provider and ask the treatment professionals, ask the treatment professionals if they are following their treatment protocol in order to believe what they're saying. You, we measure behaviors. We don't measure words. And in that comes out in BA, B-A-A-A, -A -A, BA, like a, a sheep to remember, very easy. The first thing is in their behaviors. You know, we're measuring their behaviors. Are they doing what you recommend? Are they doing? Are they going to their meetings? You know, are they going to their therapy appointment? And again, we're not... We're not only looking at 12 base treatment faci facilities here, we're looking at psych issues too. Are they seeing their psychiatrist? Are they taking the pro proper medication? Are they going to, you know, seeing their therapist on top of that? Or did you recommend group therapy for them? Are they participating in that? You know, you're measuring their behaviors that are being demonstrated, or are they isolating? You know, are they staying, you know, going back going f backwards instead of forward the next one is their attitudes when they come to you are they you know are they willing or are they combative where are they at look at their attitudes with their family systems with the treatment providers you know look for those type of signs on when to intervene because if you see these kind of signs behaving wouldn't it be more effective to re-intervene while they're in treatment, in a safe environment, have all the treatment professionals there, wouldn't it be more effective to re-intervene then than having to wait for a full-blown relapse? I mean, it just makes sense. Catch them in these behaviors. The next one is their achievements. What are their goals? You know, oh my God, as a pilot, I'm looking forward to get back at to work. You know, their achievements. What do they, what are their goals that they're looking for? You know, are there any achievements that they're looking to accomplish? You know, those are really important signs. And then their attendance. You know, are they really showing up? Are they showing up late? Are they like the woman that was in the bathroom during treatment? You know, where are they in their attendance? And if you see them falling in any of these signs, you know, get, a, get your treatment team back on to re-intervene, pull the environment in, possibly, I mean, if you're working with, with uh, I'm over here with the, you know, with, the air pro, with the pilots, what was your name again? Larry Smith, if you're working with Larry, it's easy, bring Larry in, you know, bring the employer in, bring the, bring the family system in, bring the systems around them in to help re-intervene, to get them to the point of willingness so you guys could do your work. So that's, you know, that's really when I believe it's important to intervene. And, you know, got a few more minutes here on, um, on the case management. And I think this is one of the important things that we've been talking about you know, throughout the, the, the time that I've been here is really about the case management. And I know a lot of you are doing that now. You know, I, I know that this is, is part of the treatment protocol, but I believe, again, I believe we need to make it within the industry. Some of the people that we're working with are looking at um, are any of you, do you have anybody have anybody out there that understands the new bills that are being passed for the health uh, care system that's going to be in 2014? Because we have some people that are in Washington that work with us that they've, they've been doing some research on it. And for insurance carriers to pay for your services, they need hardcore evidence-based statistics. You can't go there and say, oh, my treatment facility does this, this, and this, and, you know, these many, this amount of people stayed sober. They don't want to hear that because without case management and monitoring, without Larry Smith really knowing 
the random drug testing, the monitoring. Without that, you really don't have anything. You have hearsay. You have self-reporting. And what is self-reporting in early recovery? <laughs> What's that? Lying. <laughs> lying. <laughs> I love that one. Lying, yes. So I don't think insurance carriers are going to start paying for self-reporting anymore. I think the industry is changing, and we have some people that are in, you know, reading, going over that of what the insurance is looking for, and they are going to look for this, high, this, this level of hardcore statistics that you have on it that is documented. And the way the pilots have been doing it for years, how many years have you been doing this? 12 years. So they've been doing this for 12 years, and with... So since 1974, he says they've been doing this, the pilot's program, but really where it's been really, you know, taken to the level where it's at today is 12 years. You know, 12 years, and thank God the pilots are doing that. I fly a lot in my business, and I'm so thankful you're there. <laughs> but I ain't flying around this country back and forth with a drunk and a pilot. So I'm very grateful you're there doing that. But they have... Years, and since 1974, they have years of hardcore proven evidence. Hardcore proven evidence. If you are going to test positive or your case manager is seeing some of those warning signs, they're going to go to the licensing board and you're not going to fly, right? That's the bottom line. You're not going to fly anymore. But these are hardcore statistics. These are hard. This is a protocol that they've put into place to hold them accountable. But yet, this is what the insurance carriers are going to be looking for. This is what they're going to be looking for. And without it, I don't think they're going to be paying. That's what we've been told, is they're not going to be paying the private treatment facilities anymore without this kind of accountability. So we take this experience from the pilot's program, doctor's diversion, lawyer's assistance, and the drug court program. Again, the drug port, port, court programs, they all have the same thing. They have that level of care where they are being accountable and somebody is case managing them for a year and a half through that process. So they have their hardcore proven statistics in their back pocket to show in carriers. So again, some of the treatment centers that we're working with are looking at getting, you know, using a case management or a monitoring system, put it into place so when, and, you know, using an outside source, just like United Airlines uses an outside source to hold that to really make it where it's court approved and licensure approved, you know, you have that outside identity that is monitoring where it's not your internal, but it's somewhere outside that will give you those statistics. And it's been great. I mean, we started doing it a couple years ago, and it is just taken off really quickly because we realize in, I think it's 2014 is when it, that it's supposed to. Who knows? <laughs> we all know how the, it works in the government. But in 2014 is when it's supposed to be applied and start working. But if these are things that they're going to be looking for, and, and to be honest, I don't even think it's really about um, – it's really about um, what they're looking for. I think it's our responsibility to the public to give them what works. That's really what it's about. It's, you know, yeah, you may not be able to get insurance paid without it, but really, why not give these people the, uh, the best opportunity of being in recovery and moving forward in the future with the tools and the modalities that we already know work why not give every single human being that suffers from this disease that opportunity? And that's really where we come from as treatment providers, is figuring out how to create that and make it where it's open for everyone. And case management, I'm sure a lot of you know what a case manager is. What we, the way we do it is, you know, for case manager, is that case manager is kind of like the hub. That person is the one that talks to the... Um, the, 
primary therapist, the treatment center if they're in treatment, talks to the primary therapist that they're working with, talks to their psychiatrist, talks to their employer, talks to their family members. It, it's the person that gathers all the information and most importantly, talks to the monitoring company if there's a positive test. So they're going to be, the monitoring company is going to be in communication with the case manager that if they do not call in on that day when they're supposed to call in or if they turn out with a positive test. They carry all of that information. I don't know if, if the way you do it is the same way we do it, but the case manager is, is a clinician, but when they're, just like an interventionist is an interventionist, you know, most of our interventionists have some form of credentials in the field, but when they're doing interventions, they're not, they're not licensed clinicians. They're not they're the doctor walking in. We cross straight lines, so legal, legalities we, that we, you know, for one reason, most important, but the other reason is because we're, we're as an interventionist. We're a case manager, and we don't, the case managers do not make decisions on what happens with that person. They don't say, oh, they haven't been going to meetings, it's a positive, let's do this consequence, let's do that. They take it back to the treatment providers. They take it back to the primary therapist. They take it back to the treatment center, and they say, they ask them, what are your recommendations and what do you want followed through? And all they do is, as a, as a case manager is follow what is recommended in the treatment providers. Does that make sense? So it's not really where, because it's, it's so much better, and as treatment centers do, it's all about treatment teaming. It's not about one, treat, one person's you know, choice of what to do. It's really about treatment teaming, and that's why they gather the information, they distribute it where it needs to go, and then the treatment team decides on what the next course of action is. So with case management and monitoring, you know, it's just another great tool and benefit, and how do we believe it would help? You know, people here in, uh, in the room is the different benefits are the tools of the therapist can help with the patient with their compliance. We talked about that. So it's really about keeping the person compliant while they're in treatment. So, you know, monitoring case management. A lot of IOPs, there's a bunch of you here today. A lot of IOPs, what we've noticed is if you get a case manager that's monitoring and doing all these other things with them and taking it to the IOP, the treatment providers, and then saying, hey, the family system is noticing this red flag. This one's, you know, the employer's noticing this red flag. It kind of relieves you as the outpatient to, to having to deal with all that, those, you know, that, that part of it, but yet you know you have one person that you could go for for all that information. So it's a great tool to have, and if they relapse, if there is a red flag, they bring it right back to you, you're able to determine what the next course of action is, and I love what you said, it may be a higher level of care. Uh, Andrea Barthwell, uh, she's a good friend of us, Dr. Barthwell, and she always says, you know, I never look at, you know, if they're non-compliant with the next level of care, it's always turn, putting it up. <laughs> it's the next higher level of care, <laughs> and I love that. You know, it's really about finding out where they need to be instead of just letting them slip through the cracks because that's what we normally do. Is that, that's been my experience is they slip through the cracks because we don't have the tools of this type of system put into place, which again, the high licensed professionals have been using for years. So being able to help at that level, um, ability to create a plan to e evaluate the higher level of care, as we talked about, therapists and families that are not. Again, I always like to tell families when we start, when we do interventions now, we like to start the case management the minute they walk in that door into your treatment facility. I was supposed to have a call with one of our clients today with, that they're in a treatment facility with their primary therapist and the patient because we want them to get in, in the, in the um, momentum of working with that case manager for when that continuum care I think it's important to make that continuum level of care as seamless as possible. So what we're also looking at doing is every day while they're in treatment, they call that 800 number to be randomly tested like they have to do when they get out. So we get them started while they're in treatment. 
So that primary therapist in the treatment facility is talking with the case manager, is talking with the primary therapist, their supervisor, introducing them so they understand what their next level of care is going to be recommended, is going to be carried through. Because as treatment providers, you don't have the manpower or you have the know-how, of, or not the know-how, you all know how to do it, but you just, you, you, you can't do it. You can't do it. You can't follow a person for a year, two years, five years down the road. It's just humanly impossible to have people doing that. So you turn it over back to the care, the case manager, and then if they relapse or if they start going down some of these other behaviors, what we're looking at is look for the Baja effect. If the behavior, attendance, achievements and um, are, are all failing, then we get them back into the treatment center, maybe in an IOP, maybe into something else versus, or maybe they need to come in for a two-week refresher. You know, maybe they're just in full-blown relapse mode, but they just haven't picked up the drink yet, and maybe we need to get them in there. So we've, we've seen how it works. We know how it works. Um, putting together a discharge plan, I think, is really Again, we don't call it discharge plan, continuum level plan, but what one of the key components that we do, and I'm sure you guys probably do it with your pilots, is they sign an agreement. When do they sign an agreement when they're finished with, you know, what their treatment is going to look like? Yeah, they sign an agreement, and so see again, we've, we're already following. So how often are they, are they mandated? So, and, and again, it's a, it's a contract that United Airlines puts together for their professionals in order, if they want to fly, they are going to be compliant with this program, and part of it being AA. You know, um, and part of the monitoring, I didn't, I didn't mention that. They also do random drug testing, but they fax in once a week their meeting attendance slip also of going to 12 steps or whatever that may look like for the primary therapist and the treatment providers of what's necessary. But mostly we're dealing with drug and alcohol and, um, and that's really, they, they have to fax in or scan in an email their a meeting attendance, just like you're asking the pilots to do. So with that being said, what we do, again, because our people that we mostly work with aren't high licensed professionals, we put together a family contract that's kind of similar, kind of similar of what you're saying. If you are non-compliant with what your treatment providers over here told you you needed to do, because we're not the experts in this. You guys all are. You guys are the experts in this field. So if you're non-compliant with what the experts are telling you you need to do, then this is our line in the sand you will suffer these consequences. That's it. We put together the consequences that will mean something like the licensing board, but they sign a contract with their families before they leave. That is so important for us because then the families call us up and say, oh, they're out of, they're out of contract because of here and here and here. And of course, if they say the recommendations are 90 meetings in 90 days, you know, go, you know, whatever the treatment professionals decide what that's going to look like, and they, they skip two meetings in a row, of course, we're not going to throw them out of the house and say, we're not paying for your school and blah, blah, blah. You know, it's not going to be like you wouldn't say you're not, you're losing your license. 
you know, so we got to put together what the appropriate consequences would be, and that's really what working with a case manager is really about. You're a person that would, if they're missing some of the factors of that contract, they haven't relapsed. You know, it's not going to go into aggressive mode. It's going to go into, we see you, we hear you, we're not turning a blind eye anymore, and there will be consequences, that gentle reminder. So, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. His question was as if we were offering that service of case management because his experience has been when they leave treatment and the case manager, you know, is giving them their recommendations, they drop the ball again because no fault at all to the treatment centers. It's just you don't have the manpower to follow them for that year. So we've experienced that same situation. So two years ago, we started doing case management, and we started working with uh, monitoring companies out there that do random drug testing for pilots, doctors, lawyers. So it's the same monitoring company that work with us, and we, ha we follow them from the beginning stages, the intervention stages, through the 30, 60, 90 days. Our recommendations are always, you know, if you put it on a cookie cutter effect, the best possible plate treatment for any person that suffers from any form of addiction is getting the family involved at the family systems at the very beginning. We start that process, then we go into if maybe needing intervention, maybe not, maybe they, they just need to get, you know, go into treatment, following them through their treatment protocol, following them till the day of the discharge if it's sober living, if it's going to go back to the home environment, and then going into that year of case management and monitoring. And that's only a minimum of a year. I would say 90% of our people only need that year because the consequence back here is so aggressive, like the licensing board, and we've worked with the families. Unfortunately, like I said, 2% go to al and get the real help they need, but they still have the consequence here that they're aware of, that if they choose not to be in recovery or follow their treatment protocol, this is still on their shoulder. This is behind there. And then within a year, our experience has been, and you probably know best, our experience is most of the shift happens in that year. Most of the people make that shift in, the, in that year, and 10% of them we have to take another year on. But it's pretty minimal. Most of them happen in that year. Yes, the case manager. Her, yeah. Her, her question was, with the case manager, is there anybody working with the family? And because we're interventionist, and, you know, that's usually who calls us first is the family. That's usually our key component. But let's say a treatment provider, like we're doing a lot of treatment centers, that people go into treatment and they don't need uh, an intervention, right? So they don't have that family support. And maybe they'll come to the family week and they'll come to this or that. So what we've been doing is sending out somebody to their home to educate them of what they're learning in treatment and teaching them about that line in the sand, that they're either in compliance or not. And when, you know, when I was just at the family group, he was like, when anybody says, when an addict asks you, you know, a question, you say, oh, that's nice. Ask doctor, you know, so whoever's at the treatment center, ask your doctor. <laughs> you know, that's nice. Ask your doctor. Do not answer the question. Because the minute they answer the question, they're feeding into usually the addict's behavior. Because, again, within that first year, they're going to lie, steal. You guys all screamed it out. The sheets are dirty. The, the, the staff is going to wipe my hair, you know. They come up with the most dramatic situations to get the families 
to take them out of that environment. So the families, what we do is teach them to say, oh, that's nice, let me look into it. So they're heard, but we're not disregarding what they're saying, they're heard, let me look into it, ask your doctor, ask your therapist. And then the family goes back to the therapist, but that's the major component of working with the family system because if they're doing things that are going to feed their addiction, you know, like pay it. Like I had this one family that we worked with for years, and every time the taste manager recommended something, they would do the opposite. The family, oh, but she's doing so well. She's doing great, you know. She, but she doesn't want to go to AA. But she's doing great, you know. She, she's telling me about what she wants to do when she grows up and what she's going to be. And she's doing, and I got my baby girl back. Oh, that's great. And we're all sitting here knowing she's manipulating the whole system. There's no change here. And so we said, listen, measure the behaviors, mom. Don't measure what she's saying. Measure the action she's taking, not what she's saying. The mother wouldn't believe us. Six months later, found drunk, picked up by the police department. Okay, we'll do whatever you say. <laughs> so, any last questions? And we'll, Eric and I will be here. Yes, please. And if, what he just said, if you didn't hear him, is that, that, that the insurance is going to be looking for that, for the outcomes. They're going to want the outcomes. And again, as a provider for in this industry, I'm not only looking to be compensated financially for your services, but what's really right for the patient. What's really right for that person that's in the disease? Because we know what works. Sitting right in the room, we know what works. We have the evidence. So... It's our responsibility as treatment providers to carry that through. And that's what we need to be sharing to the, the you know, there's, they, the statistics are 25 million Americans out there suffer from this disease, and I think about 4% of them get help. And the reason why 4% of them, only 4% of them get help every year is because the family don't know the early signs to look for and don't know what to do and don't know the process we know the process. We know what to do. And it's our responsibility to give them the best care. Your question is, how many people does it take to do an intervention? To do... Um, for me, personally, I would like 15 to 20. <laughs> Get the whole environment, the employer, everybody that's involved. But realistically, one. I mean, I've had one wife pick me up at the airport in Florida, and she picks me up at the airport, and she drops me off, and she says, good luck, he's inside. I was like, what? <laughs> Didn't we talk about this already? Good luck. <laughs> so I was able to get them to go by myself. But really, one is all it really takes. But the more, the better. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you. Another round for Ken Seeley. Thank you. It's awesome.